This airplane should never have worked. A wooden bomber with no defensive guns relying only on speed? In 1938, that idea sounded insane. Yet the de Havilland Mosquito became one of the most elegant and effective aircraft of the entire war. And its greatest advantage came from a mechanic who dared to break the rules. By the late 1930s, Britain faced a simple problem. Rearmament was accelerating, but aluminum was scarce. De Havilland's genius was to look elsewhere. Wood. They perfected laminated plywood made from birch, balsa, and spruce, bonded with casein glue. Materials familiar to furniture and piano makers, not aircraft factories. The result? A bomber that could be built by civilians without stealing resources from Spitfire production. In 1939, the first design appeared. Two Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, a sleek 54-foot wingspan, and no gun turrets at all. Just a pilot and a navigator, betting their lives on mathematics and speed. While engineers chased new alloys and metals, Britain quietly discovered that its greatest wartime resource wasn't steel, it was craftsmanship. Cabinet makers, boat builders, and even piano craftsmen were suddenly building bombers. The smell of varnish mixed with aviation fuel. It wasn't just innovation, it was improvisation turned into national strategy. The Mosquito was proof that sometimes victory comes from imagination rather than brute force. Every Merlin engine came with strict power limits, boost pressures, fuel mixture ratios, temperature margins. Those limits weren't physics, they were policy. Rolls-Royce engineers built in huge safety buffers to guarantee reliability across thousands of engines. But those limits also meant untapped power waiting to be unlocked, if someone was brave enough to try. That someone was Sergeant Roderick Banks. Not an engineer, just a mechanic who read every technical document he could find. He'd trained at Rolls-Royce before the war, so he understood the Merlin's guts like few others. In 1943, he noticed something interesting. The manual said maximum boost equals 18 PSI, but the metallurgy tables suggested it could take a bit more, safely if perfectly maintained. Banks began to wonder, what if you use some of that safety margin? Just a little. He wasn't a rebel. He was meticulous, quiet, almost obsessive. To him, rules weren't walls. They were starting points. Every late night in the hangar, surrounded by the hum of generators and the metallic scent of oil, Banks studied how to make the Merlin breathe better, burn cleaner, run harder. He wasn't looking for glory. He just hated watching pilots die because a piece of machinery could have done more. Here's what Banks did. Boost control, swapped in a slightly softer spring, max boost raised from 18 to 20 PSI. Fuel mixture, made it richer under full power. Extra fuel evaporated inside the cylinders, cooling them about 40 degrees Celsius. Ignition timing, advanced a few degrees, squeezing more power from each stroke. These tweaks gave about plus 100 horsepower per engine, roughly plus 15 miles per hour more speed at altitude. The catch, faster wear, shorter engine life, and disaster if done wrong. Banks only modified perfect engines fresh from overhaul. The first test aircraft, Mosquito DZ-414, flew a photo recon mission over the Ruhr. Two Focke Wolf 190s gave chase. Squadron leader Peter Channer pushed the throttles past the stop. The boost needles climbed past the red line. The Mosquito surged forward. Speed passed 400 miles per hour, and the German fighters fell behind. It wasn't luck or maneuvering, it was physics. News spread fast. Pilots began requesting the bank's tune-up. Modified mosquitoes started coming back from missions that unmodified aircraft rarely survived. Reports told the same story again and again. Fewer losses, faster escapes, more survivors. Statistics didn't lie. Banks' machines had roughly half the casualty rate of standard ones. Soon, pilots would bring bottles of scotch to Banks' workshop as thanks. They'd shake his hand before missions, small gestures loaded with meaning. When those same pilots returned, engines ticking hot under the moonlight, the first thing they did was find him. She ran like a dream, they'd say. Those words meant more to Banks than any medal. It wasn't about recognition. It was about proof that his calculations had kept men alive. February 1944. A desperate mission bombed the walls of Amiens prison to free French resistance members scheduled for execution. The mosquitoes flew at rooftop height, 
in broad daylight, with German flak and fighters waiting. The walls were breached perfectly, hundreds escaped. On the way back, the Luftwaffe swarmed. Out of 19 aircraft, three were shot down. None of them had Banks's modifications. All 12 tuned mosquitoes made it home. Those extra 10 to 15 miles per hour made the difference between freedom and flames. Luftwaffe engineers scrambled to respond. They upgraded the BF-109, G-10, and FW-190, even built the TA-152H, a high-altitude superfighter. On paper, they could match the Mosquito. In reality, they came too late, in too few numbers, built in bombed-out factories with poor-quality metals. German mechanics who tried similar overboosts often ended up with engines exploding right off the runway. Across the channel, the Luftwaffe was unraveling under pressure. Their pilots now called the Mosquito the Ghost because it appeared without warning and vanished faster than radar could track. Hitler demanded an explanation. Goering fumed, blaming his engineers. But the truth was brutal. The Germans had reached the ceiling of what their engines could handle. While British mechanics were stretching the rules, Germany's factories were running on fumes with inferior metals and exhausted workers. It wasn't just a battle of planes. It was a battle of philosophy, flexibility versus fear. For every success, there was a cost. Engines wore out faster, maintenance hours doubled, and sometimes the margin of safety disappeared completely. Banks knew that every extra mile per hour came with a shadow. He wrote letters to families when modified engines failed. Not because he had to, but because he felt responsible. He once told a fellow mechanic, if one of these engines dies, I want to make sure the men don't. That's how personal it became. More power meant more wear. Banks enforced a strict rule. Pull every modified Merlin at 150 hours, no matter how healthy it looked. Even so, a few engines failed. Cracked valves, burned pistons, forced landings. But compared to combat losses, mechanical failures were a small price. In war, an engine dying early was better than a crew dying for good. When Ernest Hives, the head of Rolls-Royce, arrived unannounced, the workshop froze. Every mechanic thought Banks was finished. But instead of anger, Hives saw brilliance. A man who'd done under fire what his own committees hadn't dared in peace. That meeting lasted hours, two minds dissecting data and performance curves. When they shook hands, it wasn't just approval, it was validation. For the first time, the boundary between field ingenuity and corporate engineering disappeared. In February 1945, Sir Ernest Hives, head of Rolls-Royce Aero Engines, showed up unannounced at Banks's workshop. Instead of court-martialing him, he listened. He saw the data, the survival rates, and agreed. A month later, Rolls-Royce issued Technical Service Bulletin 184, officially approving the same boost increase Banks had pioneered. The illegal tweak was now company policy, and those lessons were quickly applied to Spitfires and Mustangs as well. By the end of the war, modified Mosquitoes had flown over 8,000 combat sorties, with less than half the loss rate of standard planes. Hundreds of airmen made it home because one mechanic dared to question the manual. No new parts, no new technology, just knowledge, precision, and courage. After 1945, Banks joined Rolls-Royce as an experimental engineer. He never sought fame. His name didn't appear in official records, but his fingerprints were all over the final generations of the Merlin engine. He died in 1992, quietly in Derby, the city whose engines helped win the war. The Mosquito became legendary, the wooden wonder. It bombed the Gestapo in broad daylight, photographed Berlin, and outran the Luftwaffe for six long years. De Havilland designed it brilliantly, but a single sergeant made it faster, deadlier, and smarter. Sometimes innovation doesn't come from design offices. It comes from a workshop, from someone who knows a machine so well they dare to ask, what if we could push it just a little more?